from the littleness and meanness and niggardliness forced upon us by our circumstances, what a relief to turn aside to the exceeding plenty of nature. There are no bounds to it. There is no comparison to parallel it. So great is this generosity. If I could but give away freely, as the earth does. Never was there such a lying proverb as enough is as good as a feast. Give me the feast. Give me squandered millions of seeds, luxurious carpets of petals, green mountains of oak leaves. The greater the waste, the greater the enjoyment, the nearer the approach to real life. No physical reason exists why every human being should not have sufficient at least of necessities. For any human being to starve or even to be in trouble about the procuring of simple food appears indeed a strange and unaccountable thing, quite upside down and contrary to sense, if you do but consider a moment the enormous profusion the earth throws at our feet. that 12,000 written years have elapsed and the human race, able to reason and to think and easily capable of combination in immense armies for its own destruction, should still live from hand to mouth. That there should not even be roofs to cover the children born unless those children labor and expend their time to pay for them. That there should not be clothes unless again time and labor are expended to procure them that there should not even be food for the children of the human race except they labor as their fathers did 12,000 years ago, that even water should scarce be accessible to them unless paid for by labor. It is so marvelous I cannot express the wonder with which it fills me. And more wonderful still, there are people so infatuated, or rather so limited of view, that they glory in this state of things declaring that work is the main object of man's existence and glorying in their wasted time. This, our earth, this day, produces sufficient for our existence. I verily believe that the earth in one year produces enough food for 30 and that the labor and time of 10 generations properly directed would sustain a hundred generations succeeding them. Instead of which with transcendent improvidence the world works only for today as the world worked 12,000 years ago and our children's children will still have to toil and slave for the bare necessities of life. If the world does not provide them freely, not as a grudging gift, but as a right, then is the world mad. But the world is not mad, only in ignorance, an interested ignorance. 
kept up by strenuous exertions from which infernal darkness it will in course of time emerge, marvelling at the past as a man wonders at and glories in the light who has escaped from blindness. I hope succeeding generations will be able to be idle. I hope that nine-tenths of their time will be leisure time, that they may enjoy their days and the earth and the beauty of this beautiful world, that they may rest by the sea and dream, that they may dance and sing and eat and drink. They shall not work for bread but for their souls. I am willing to divide and share all I have for this purpose, though I think that the end will rather be gained by organization than by sharing alone. been dreaming, whilst hundreds out in the meadow have been intensely happy. So concentrated on their little work out in the sunshine, so intent on the tiny egg, on the insect captured on the grass tip to be carried to the eager fledglings, so joyful in listening to the song poured out for them, or in pouring it forth, quite oblivious of all else. It is in this intense concentration that they are so happy. If they could only live longer. I wish they could live a hundred years just to feast on the seeds and sing and be utterly happy and oblivious of everything but the moment they are passing. I cannot leave them. Each gives me something of the pure joy they gather for themselves. In the blackbird's melody, one note is mine. In the dance of the leaf shadows, the formed maze is for me, though the motion is theirs. The flowers with a thousand faces have collected the kisses of the morning. Feeling with them, I receive some at least of their fullness of life. Never could I have enough, never stay long enough, lying on the time-scented hills, hour after hour, and still not enough. The hours when the mind is absorbed by beauty are the only hours when we really live. So that the longer we stay among these things, so much the more is snatched from inevitable time. 
Let the shadow advance upon the dial. I can watch it with equanimity while it is there to be watched. Let not the eyes grow dim. Look not back but forward. The soul must uphold itself like the sun. Let us labor to make the heart grow larger as we become older, as the spreading oak gives more shelter. If we had never before looked upon the earth, but suddenly came to it, man or woman grown, set down in the midst of a summer mead, would it not seem to us a radiant vision? The hues, the shapes, the song and life of birds, above all, the sunlight, the breath of heaven resting on it, the mind would be filled with its glory unable to grasp it, hardly believing that such things would be mere matter and no more. Like a dream of some spirit land it would appear, scarce fit to be touched, lest it should fall to pieces. Too beautiful to be long watched, lest it should fade away. Still the pageant moves, it thunders, the soft turtle doves coo gently, let the lightning be savage as it will, so trustful are the doves, the squirrels, the birds of the branches and the creatures of the field. Under their tuition, let us rid ourselves of mortal terrors and face death itself as calmly as they do the vivid lightning. So trustful and so content with their fate, resting in themselves and unappalled. The procession of living and growing things still passes. There is so much for us yet to come, so much to be gathered and enjoyed. Not for me now, but for the future race, who will ultimately use this magical secret for their happiness. As I found from the dandelion that there were no books, so they shall by and by come to the alchemy and get the honey for the inner mind and soul. Earth holds secrets enough to give them the life of the fabled immortals. My heart is fixed, firm and stable in the belief that ultimately the sunshine and the summer, the flowers and the azure sky shall become, as it were, interwoven into man's existence. He shall take from all their beauty and enjoy their glory. I look in the glass and see that every line in my face means pessimism. But in spite of my face, I remain an optimist. Time, with an unsteady hand, has etched crooked lines, and deepening the hollows has cast my original expression into shadow. Pain and sorrow 
flow over me with little ceasing as the sea hoofs beat on the beach. Let us not look at ourselves, but onwards, and take strength from the leaf and the signs of the field. He is indeed despicable who cannot look onwards to the ideal life of man. Not to do so is to deny our birthright of mind. All my best work was done in an intense agony. Richard Jeffries died on the 14th of August, 1887. The doctor commented that he was a very marked case of hysteria in man. No one seems to understand how I got food from the clouds nor what there was in the night, nor why it is not so good to look at it out of a window. They turn their faces away from me, so that perhaps after all I was mistaken, and there never was any such place or any such meadows, and I was never there. And perhaps in course of time I shall find out also, when I pass away physically, that as a matter of fact, there never was any earth. There never was any earth. There never was a yesterday, whispered the wind to Bevis presently and there never will be tomorrow. It is all one long today. When the man on the hill was, you were too, and he still is, now you are here. If you were to ask the people who live in the houses where they will not let me in, they would tell you he died thousands of years ago, but they are foolish. It was hardly so long ago as yesterday. But of these things you will know when you are older. That is, if you only continue to drink me. Come, dear, said the wind to Bevis. Let us race again.
I dip my hand in the brook and feel the stream. In an instant, the particles of water which first touched me have floated yards down the current. My hand remains there. I take my hand away, and the flow, the time of the brook, does not exist to me. The great clock of the firmament, the sun and the stars, the crescent moon, the earth circling two thousand times, is no more to me than the flow of the brook when my hand is withdrawn. My soul has never been, and never can be, dipped in time. Time has never existed and never will. It is a purely artificial arrangement. It is eternity now. It always was eternity, and always will be. By no possible means could I get into time if I tried. I am in eternity now and must there remain. Haste not, be at rest, this now is eternity.